Welcome to the Recruiting Stories Podcast, where we celebrate recruiting by exploring the stories of leaders and top performers by digging into their stories and understanding how recruiting has impacted their journey and their success. Guys, welcome back to another episode of the Recruiting Stories Podcast. Do you know what the number one undergraduate supply chain program in the country is? It's the University of Arkansas. And this week, I am thrilled to introduce you to David Dobrzowski and Brian Fugate. Both of them are professors um, at the University of Arkansas, the Sam Walton College of Business. David is actually the director of the Master of Science program in supply chain management. And then Brian is the chair of the department. Um, Awesome to speak with them for a few reasons. One, um, I wanted to get uh, a different take um, in someone who might be outside of the industry. Um, but also who trains people, prepares people for the industry. They've both been in the industry and uh, really cool to hear their story, their recruiting story, how they got into supply chain um, and then and uh, supply chain and logistics and then ended up as professors uh, at the University of Arkansas. Super cool to hear that story. Also be great to really hear their you know take on what's going on in the world. They do a ton of research and uh, really interesting to hear a little bit about the research that they are doing at the University of Arkansas. Um, And then also how do they prepare their students both in their undergrad and master's programs to uh, be ready for the transportation and supply chain industry. Really interesting to kind of talk with them and uh, hear a little bit about what makes him different, what makes him the number one um, supply chain program in the country. And I think you're gonna enjoy it as well. Additionally, you might have seen their number one supply chain program sign that made it on college game day on ESPN and has been all over the world at this point. Uh, it actually makes it on my show, so I'm super excited um, that uh, we, we have made it as a, as a podcast here and as a show. If you watch the uh, YouTube version, you'll get a chance to see that, so that's exciting. But take a listen. I think you'll enjoy hearing from them. Uh, hearing their background, how they got into transportation, and uh, of course, if you're interested in furthering your education or uh, setting yourself up for success in the future, um, I think you should check out the University of Arkansas Supply Chain Program. Enjoy it. All right, welcome to another edition of the Recruiting Stories Podcast, powered by Cover 3 Consulting. Um, guys, super excited. This week, we have Brian uh, Fugate, Chair of the Department of Supply Chain Management at the University of Arkansas, and uh, David Dobrukowski, Director of the Master of Science Program in Supply Chain Management. Welcome, guys. Hey, Adrian. How are you? We're good. Good. Glad uh, to be here. Yeah. Did, did I get your titles and names correct? Is that right? Anything you guys want to add? I don't think so. I think that's right on the mark. I mean, maybe the only thing I would add for Brian is that in addition to being the chair of the department, which is more of an administrative leadership role, he's also an endowed chair from a research perspective, which means he's a research stud. That's what that means. No, I mean, we're both, we all, we have these administrative roles, but we're both professors, right? So we teach and we research and, and do all of that. So cool. Love it. Well, I'm excited to have you guys on just, uh, you know, we've, with the Recruiting Stories podcast, we talk with a number of people in the transportation and logistics industries, um, business owners, you know, executive at 3PL um, companies uh, across the, the country, um, you know, really getting a view of, hey, how did recruiting impact their journey, uh, their view of the transportation industry? Uh, and I thought, man, what a better um, chance, especially with everything going on in the world right now. Talk to people who teach on that subject uh, on a daily, weekly basis. So excited to talk with you guys. So really kind of wanted to start with, um, you know, how did you guys get into the field that you're in today? Like, How did you end up um, being a professor of supply chain management? Yeah, well, um, so my story is probably one that could be titled something like, you know, who's the least likely to be a supply chain professor or something like that. Um, So I was a healthcare guy. Uh, I had a 13-year career in industry in healthcare administration prior to my wacky PhD. And, uh, you know, during that time, I worked about six or seven years on the provider side of healthcare with organizations like Bon Secours Mercy out of Cincinnati. I'm originally an Ohioan. Um, so, you know, on the acute care healthcare delivery side, I had a real opportunity to see all the, you know, fragmentation and disconnects in the healthcare system. And, then the other six years or so of my career, I, I spent in the insurance services 
kind of area in healthcare, working with companies like United Healthcare. And you see the same types of problems in terms of misalignments and payment systems and so forth in healthcare. So when you think about what supply chain means to an academic, is it's a little bit different a lot of times than than in industry. Like like we're not a functional area necessarily, but from an academic perspective, supply chain to us really means the study of how we share information, material, and financial exchanges you know, within and outside the boundaries of our organization, and do so around best practices and. When you think about some of the challenges that face healthcare providers, um, you know, those are really important flows to study. So, you know, that made the, the study of supply chain an obvious one to me, um, when it might not be obvious that a healthcare guy could, you know, turn into a supply chain professor. That's awesome. Well, so then what was, what was kind of the pivot point for you, uh, David? Was there, um, you know, a moment where you're like, okay, I, I'm super interested in how this information or how the supply chain moves to the point where I need to study this. Like I need to do some, or maybe even a person who made you, you know, created a fork in the road for you. Yeah. Yeah. And no, absolutely. Well, so for me, um, again, I was the least likely, you know, person to ever be a professor, right? Because literally when I left, um, you know, campus after my uh, senior year, I remember uh, we were on the quarter system at the time we we're in Ohio. And I literally walked off campus and I looked at heaven and I said, thank you, Jesus. I will never be on a university campus again. <laughs> and true story. And that lasted about two and a half years because I got out into the work world, like I mentioned. And I started to see that, you know, uh, every job posting that I was, you know, desired to move into said master's degree preferred or master's degree required. So I thought, oh, doggone, I guess I'm going to have to go back. And when I went back, because I had been in the workplace for a while, you know, the experience was completely different, right? It was so meaningful to me to actually see that the stuff I should have been learning a long way, but I was learning, you know, in, in a master's program, allowed me to be a better manager and allowed me to make decisions that, you know, advance the organization. Uh, and that actually led to adjunct with the idea of being around students. And I fell in love with the idea of having something fresh every semester, you know, a fresh set of faces, maybe a fresh topic. In our case, you know, we do a lot of research, so fresh research ideas. Um, and that really drew me into the discipline. It took seven more years after that, but that's what drew me into the discipline. That's awesome. Very and, cool. And, you know, I don't know if you get into these kind of questions, but it, it probably needs to be said that, you know, something else may have helped in that space, too. What, tell them about your, your side gig, that you were almost a professional athlete. Yeah. You were a professional athlete. Yes. Yeah, I don't mean, to, you know, I'm the least intimidating guy, and this actually goes into that why I'm so unintimidating, but I always tell students on the first day that, you know, you're in the room with a retired professional athlete. Yeah, and you maybe you miss the sports center presser, but yeah, it's true. I'm a retired professional bowler. So the bowling gig, you know, yeah, the bowling gig, uh, you know, was boring on a whole new level, right? To <laughs> academe, right? So I was like, this is still kind of interesting. I need to be a professor and be a, a total nerd. So <laughs> anyway, hey, I'm still on my pathway to being a total nerd. <laughs> if you've ever tried uh, tried to, to bowl a perfect game, I, I have all the respect for you in the world because it's way harder than it looks. Yeah, I've had 14, actually, uh, a couple on the Pro Tour. Yeah, that's awesome. But that pales in the comparison to most people a day. But thank goodness, Adrian, we are not here to talk about bowling. Well, <laughs> I mean, you, you get me sidetracked, and uh, I, I want to know all about your technique and your form and, and all of that. So. Yeah. Oh, so you're a bowler. Now I'm a poor bowler, just like I'm a poor golfer. As well. Okay, <laughs> but I but I enjoy both of them. I enjoy both of them, and that's I guess that's what they say matters, right? That's yeah, gonna, uh, that's true. Them. Well, they're both they're both sports that you can play long into your your life. So, that's right. but I, I I'm putting a golf club in my kids' hands. There you go, smart idea. I was a football and track athlete, and kind of once you're done, you're kind of done. Like you you know you have your good years, and it's not like I can put a, a football helmet back on anymore. Um, it's just it's kind well, of over after that. <laughs> well brian's a big basketball fan so he you know he he can stay active that way so. yeah you can shoot hoops any time right? you still yeah. play uh no no um i coach <laughs> i coach little league you know <laughs> there you go so have fun and study it and all of that just well, a fan good year for the the uh the razorbacks hopefully uh, they get a good spot here in the tournament coming coming up that's right that's right, right. they're fun well, Brian, tell, tell me a little bit about your backstory. How did you uh, end up where you are? How did you get into teaching? Um, where did you start? Yeah, so I, um, I mean, 
I'm not going to go this far back, so it'll be very brief. But I did grow up on a. It all kind of started. I grew up on a on a pig farm up in up in the hills of East Tennessee, in Appalachia, and we grew an operation to having seven thousand head of of hog. And I found just I just fell in love with the whole growth idea and managing the whole thing and, and efficiencies and effectiveness. I didn't use any of those words right back then, but um, and so I went into industrial engineering because of that and. I uh, wanted to go work in a, you know, in the auto industry, and that's where I started uh, at an auto supplier making airbags, uh, implementing total production system and lean and and all of that kind of stuff, and quickly ran into the problem of doing really well inside of our manufacturing firm after some trial and error, uh, and, and the constraint then became our suppliers and some to our customers, but mostly our suppliers, which made me experience this idea of supply chain management, that we had to go right. outside the four walls of our firm. And so then I went on to, to Delta Airlines and John Deere. I worked in worldwide logistics and supplier development, doing some of the same kind of stuff. Um, and then, you know, mine was probably a little simpler. I, I kind of looked ahead at what, what, what the people did that, who succeeded in that area and I just didn't feel like that was me. What I what I felt like was I got frustrated at solving the same problems over and over and over mm -hmm. um, every quarter. And I really wanted to take time to understand what are the what are the underlying things that are happening. Right. Uh, and and so that's my wife asked me said, well, if you if you inherited millions of dollars, what would you do? And I said, I'd go back and, and research and teach. Hmm. And I mostly wanted research. And fell in love with teaching too. Um, I really didn't know if I would like teaching that much, but I fell in love with it after after you start impacting students, it's hard not to fall in love with it. So so then that led me down this path. So. Mm. That's amazing. So I love I love the fact that for you it was almost like there was a problem. Um, well, even for both of you, there's almost like, hey, I ran into a problem and that problem led me to supply chain. And so rather than saying, Well, I hope somebody fixes it, you both put your hands in the fire, so to speak, to say, I want to be the one who helps figure out some of the problems here and, and be a part of the solution, which uh, I think is awesome. Which is, which well, is supply that. chain people are great problem solvers, right? But, yeah. you know, more specifically, as a pig farmer, he was destined to be a Razorback. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I was I was thinking that. I was trying to see if I could come up with a good joke, but I wasn't fast enough. So. Yeah. <laughs> I've tried. I've, it's never worked for me. It's always fallen flat, so I just don't even try anymore. <laughs> that's awesome very cool so okay for both of you i'm curious if you if you didn't get into transportation um and and education where do you think you'd be like well, if you didn't take that fork in the road where do you think you'd be instead a pig farmer <laughs> <laughs> there you go and broke uh <laughs> no i mean i would i would have probably i love my job and oh you said not in so you're just the, the whole discipline of transportation and supply chain. You're saying yeah, if I yeah. didn't do that, yeah, pig farm. That's my answer. So <laughs> yeah, I'd probably be running a hospital or working in a health system somewhere uh, in administration. You know, that was the career path that I was going on. I, I I'm really passionate about improving healthcare delivery. Like it's important to me. I mean, I I love research. Like I I would do research in many many areas, right? But I concentrate in healthcare and healthcare operations and supply supply chain because I believe there's just so much scope and so much importance, you know, to improve, uh, you know, the performance of healthcare providers. So if I wasn't doing it from a research perspective, I'd be doing it in industry somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. Okay. So tell me then more about Arkansas, right? You guys, um, I noticed that we have the, the number one supply chain sign um, today, if you're listening, if you're just listening and you're not watching the video, we have the world famous number one supply chain, um, University of Arkansas sign that's been on around the world. It's been on Sports Center. It's been on College Game Day and probably a number of other places. Um, so that's a big Good deal. Morning, so, America. Yeah, everywhere. I just it's ever so. I'm I'm excited in, that we've been graced with the presence of the sign. Um, but uh, t tell me more about uh, Arkansas. You guys are number one in the country. 
tell me a little bit about maybe why you guys are the number one in the country and maybe why people should consider um, the University of Arkansas Supply Chain Program, whether that's undergrad or the graduate program. So, so I'll go first. The reason is him. No, so no, now, no, now, no, now, no, now no. Brian can take it over. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> remind me to do this, not do this with you again. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, so, so the, the story of this program is, is actually pretty interesting, and, and, and I'll keep it brief. But we, we were historically a, a, a phenomenal transportation uh, program. I mean, we're going way back like 60s, 70s, 80s, and and then Walmart, obviously, uh, took off, and so we were really, really good in, in retail, so retail and transportation, and then, so if you came to the University of Arkansas until about probably 15 years ago, you know, you were going into transportation or, or retail, and we're still great at those. That's still core to us. Um, transportation, you know, the, the number of transportation companies around here um, that have Hired, hired our students, a number of alumni that are in all kinds of different transportation companies, logistics companies, um, is huge. And so we're still really, really, you know, big and great on that. What we've done over the last probably five, six years is expand that earlier, and that's this integrated supply chain management program. So uh, we, we hired uh, one of the best sourcing experts um, in the world, Rimco Van Hoek, Dr. Rimco Van Hoek. He had just come from, he was a chief procurement officer at Disney and worked with all kinds of other, you know, and so, and he's a professor, well published and all of that. And, and he's helped build that up. We hired Rod and Stephanie Thomas, and Mark Scott and on and on. There's a whole bunch. I won't keep going. It's everybody. And what we did was fill out the integrated supply chain, all the different areas and how they fit together and redesigned our curriculum around that. And we did that with input from uh, industry, all of our industry partners. And so that'd be the second thing is historically, people, if you ask which program was most connected to industry, and this was before I was ever here, everybody would point to the University of Arkansas. Because of Dean Waller, Matt Waller, Brent Williams, and, and all the crew before, John Osmond had just spent their time relationally doing projects and, and all of that with industry. And so very, very, very connected and, and relevant curriculum, relevant research, relevant program. So, you know, that's two of the, two of the things. I'll, I'll stop there. You can fill in or ask questions or whatever. But. We get excited about it. We love the students. So, and they're well, phenomenal students. One of the things I think you said that I, I think it's great is your, how connected you guys are to industry. And obviously, I think that would make sense because in my mind, when I think of uh, any university, one of, their main, I mean, one of their primary roles is to prepare students for life after college, right? And that preparation uh, typically involves, you know, uh, help, helping prepare for a career, right? In, in the industry that you're studying for. And the more exposure that you have, uh, in my mind, to um, real companies, real situations, real opportunities, um, you know, you're going to be more prepared to jump right in and say, hey, I'm going to be productive and have a, a better career, I would think. That's, that's, yeah. So we say, you know, Industry companies are the labs in which our students learn. So our most of our courses have students. They don't just bring industry into the classroom. We bring students out in and work on real things where they've got to deliver uh, projects. And, you know, we do things like we have one course that, that that's just full on company projects and all. And, and that's all they work on all semester. They learn project management and agile and some things. But. When I am involved, I tell the companies to come in halfway through and change everything because that's real, right? So, uh, you know, that's the way it works. And so the students, that's tough on them, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because the grades impact all that kind of stuff. They're kind of worried about all that, but we're preparing them and, and we take that seriously. And, you know, we, we also... You know, when I talk about broadening it out, one of the biggest gifts was Dr. Dobokowski, um, and it was David here, and and bringing a whole nother perspective of of service operations and healthcare, and mm -hmm. and and yet he's also doing a bunch of research in transportation and logistics and getting pubs in that, and so he's he's a he's another big reason. So, 
Well, and Brian's totally right, you know, in that 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 philosophy in terms of having the end-to-end curriculum where, mm-hmm. you know, you're not just learning about logistics and transportation, well, that's very important, but you're also learning about operations, right? How to manage a manufacturing facility, how to manage a service operation, right? You're learning about procurement, right? And all the more upstream type mm-hmm. of activities, how to source strategically, how to think, you know, both glo- globally and locally. It, it's really that end-to-end understanding that's so important because, you know, frankly, when I have discussions heck this week with uh, inbound transportation at a large retailer you know this fellow was you know lamenting the fact not that he necessarily couldn't get the lanes that he wanted but because the merchants were making orders that simply could not possibly be delivered right Mm -hmm. so it's it's very i mean don't get me wrong it happens right where we have these narrowly scoped challenges that we deal with at work but the reality is most of our challenges cross functional areas in my opinion and i think in our view you know, will make today and tomorrow supply chain leaders. And, and that's also the case at the graduate level with our master's of science in supply chain management. It's a little bit different program because all, almost all of our folks are already working, right? So, you know, when they come on Saturdays and, you know, they're, you know, talking about a case study or a project that they're doing at work or hearing from a guest speaker or doing a computer simulation on agile project management, they're taking that back Monday morning right. and, you know, hopefully implementing something at work. I mean, I end every one of my classes with the question, typically I teach in the morning. You know, if it's 12.05, because I do occasionally run over, um, you know, what can you do now that you couldn't do at 8 o'clock in the morning? And if the answer is you're not sure, then we need to talk over lunch or or, we need to figure something out. Um, And and that's really, I think, you know, a, a nice way to think about the integrated nature of our program, but also the applied you know, nature of our program. You ought to be able to do something at, at the end of each class, not at the end of a semester, not at the end of the program, but at the end of each class that you yeah. couldn't have done at the beginning of the class. It's, it's but it's this integrated thing that makes it exciting, an exciting career to go in because it's it's not just left brain or right brain. It's right. both. And and it's it's not just quantitative. It, it's also relational because it's complex. So take take for example, you know, what's the biggest constraint right now in the transportation industry the trucking industry what would you say oh gosh capacity or fuel prices right okay so capacity right and fuel prices being being kind of moderating that impact so capacity when you look at the if you look at integrated supply chain across the supply chain and, and you start studying it and looking at where can we free up capacity the most? Well, we try to hire more drivers, try to get more whatever, but that's a challenge. What can we do? Well, one of those is the dock door exchange. Right. So think of all the time that's wasted at dock doors. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a very, very small, narrow problem that that we the companies are trying to solve right now. Because if you can free that up, everything else, the capacity increases for mm-hmm. everybody, right? Truck drivers are happier. Everything gets better. But you can't do that just in that narrow scope. You have to look at sourcing. You have to look at all the manufacturing firms. You have to look at retail. You have to. It all has to fit together, which for our students, you know, that's what they fall in love with. It's like, that's complex. Yeah. Yeah. It's a new challenge every day. So anyway, you can tell we get excited. You know what I'm saying? Sorry. Well, just just one more point (laughs) if I could on that, because what makes that even, even more cool is the fact that, again, you know, with our master's program, it's not, you know, David standing up there for four hours, wah, 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 right? I mean, it's bringing in guest speakers. It's having our students present projects. And, you know, one of the coolest experiences was uh, last semester, uh, I was teaching a supply chain value creation course, which is one part process improvement, one part project management, right? You figure out how to improve a process, and then second, figure out how to implement that solution. And we've got a team that's standing up there presenting a solution for a large carrier where they're developing an app, right? And they're mm-hmm. going through all the challenges and why this app is important and what it needs to do and how they should implement it to improve driver satisfaction and retention and efficiency and all these things, right? And one of the other learners raises his hand and he stands up and he says, well, you know who can help you with that? And they said, well, no, who? And he says, well, my company, because he works for a large 3PL, right? Yeah, and yeah. So, so the cross-pollinization and, and the, the learning that takes place because people are really out there doing it. Right. It's just a really cool thing to, to watch. Absolutely. Well, and, and that's one of the beauties to me of just the transportation industry as a whole is how, you know, how interconnected it has to be um, 
you know, because if you're not aware of what's going on in Russia and Ukraine right now, if you're not aware of uh, gas prices, if you're not aware of what's happening, you know, uh, when it comes to if the borders are open between U.S. and Canada, if you're not, you know, aware of uh, inflation, you know, if you're not aware of all of these things, then obviously you're not going to succeed as well as you could in any part uh, of any role in transportation or supply chain. You have to be, uh, you got to be hooked in to everything going on in the world. And to me, I think that's that's super attractive as someone who's like, man, I, I do want to know what's going on in the world. And you're forced to <laughs> if you're in the transportation and supply chain industry. And it sounds like uh, you're at Arkansas, you're giving them a broad view of, yeah, hey, we're not we're not right here just looking just at the dock door. The dock door affects everything else. And we've got to be connected if I'm hearing that right. Well said. Very well said. So you get an A if you're in our class. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, you really put Adrian on the spot with that question. I'm like kind of nervous. <laughs> I, I thought you did really well. I'll listen to you. you a know. plus. A plus. <laughs> I'll look for my honorary Arkansas degree in the mail. There you go. <laughs> you know, call the hogs. So. There you go. I'll, I'll work on it. Uh, cool. So, okay. So, you guys have you mentioned obviously you know your undergrad program, your uh, your master's program. So, when I got my MBA, um, it was just after college. Um, and while I'm glad I got it, there was so much that I did not understand. Um, when I stepped back, you know, five years into my career, I looked back at those classes and I was like, oh, wow. Now I understand. Do you target um, people who are already in their careers for your master's program in supply chain, or are those two separate paths? What's that look like? Yeah, well, that that's a terrific question, and you know, I think that uh, you know, while there's no one right answer, right? I mean, the correct answer is it, it depends. And I hate to be a professor to say that, but it, it really <laughs> does depend on your personal circumstances and situation. But you know, generally speaking, probably for most people. Uh, I think we tend to encourage folks to go out, get some work experience, come back after, I don't know, three, four, five, eight years, right? Uh, and, and the experience tends to be much more meaningful uh, if you're able to do that. Now, that's not true for everyone, you know, particularly our undergrads. I mean, we have probably 100% placement rate. Our, our undergrads are doing two and three internships before they get out of here. You know, they're coming to me in October saying, hey, I've got two job offers that start in May. Which one should right. I take? You know, right. so so in that circumstance, they're not the David Dobrikowskis of 1995, right? They're not those undergrads that, you know, were hanging around the bowling alley for 10 years, right? And now I, I guess I need to make a resume. I mean, these are people who are prepared, right? So they do bring a heck of a lot more business acumen, business experience than certainly someone that doesn't have those experiences. So So it's not always the case, but certainly business experience is very important. The profile of our master's uh, of science students uh, is that they're 32 years old. They tend to have about eight years or so, 10 years of work experience. They come from a variety of academic backgrounds, much like supply chain professionals, right? Everything from kinesiology to physics to you know business and economics and, and so forth, right? They tend to be really bright people, average GPA around 3.3, 3.4. Um, and again, I think most importantly, they're working for some of the leading supply chain organizations in the world. Uh, here in, in Arkansas, in Northwest Arkansas. And then also importantly, so 1B, is that they're passionate about supply chain. You know, one of the most important thing aspects of an application is that that purpose statement or that essay. And, you know, while I think grammar is important, um, we're reading it for purpose, right? Well, what does this person want to do? What are they passionate about that's going to make them, you know, a supply chain leader? And, you know, if you've got that, then you can do great things. Now, we're also expanding the scope. OK, because there are folks who want to do it full time because, our, you know, because we target working professionals, it's primarily a part time program. You know, you come here once a month. We deliver content asynchronously online. And in two years or so, you're done. But some people say, hey, you know, I'm excited right now. I want to knock this thing out. And for those folks, we're also introducing an online uh, MS degree, Master's of Science, that will start in August. Same curriculum. 30 credit hours, 10 courses, deep dive in the supply chain, end to end, you know, a fully integrated, uh, you know, curriculum from a functional area perspective and a content perspective, but delivered online so that, you know, we can provide more courses, you can move more quickly through the program, uh, which would be great for folks who might just be starting their career, they might have to move out of the area. You know, we have people in the program now who moved here from 
New Jersey, Florida, yeah. Texas, Tennessee. Uh, you know, with the online offering, people won't have to make that that two year relocation, and I think that'll make it a lot more appealing for for that group of folks as well. So when you think of the supply chain hubs, you know, we recruit in a lot of big supply chain hubs, uh, Atlanta, Chicago, you know, Dallas, LA, wherever, right? And they say, you know, hey, I am interested in that with that new online program for their masters. Hey, I, I'm, I'm interested. I'm in it. I can I could jump on um, and, and you know, potentially earn uh, a degree from the University of Arkansas, even if I'm in one of those locations. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's the idea is, you know, we, we have a very strong uh, alumni base that's literally global. Right. Um, but in terms of the concentration, it's really Dallas and, you know, northwest Arkansas and kind of this mid-south region. You know, this online uh, delivery mechanism is a way that we can provide flexibility for working professionals uh, or for folks that want to, you know, move more quickly through the program and at the same time expand that geographic reach. So we're really excited about it. That's cool. Very good. Very good. Well, so one of the questions I, I get a lot from people is, you know, maybe they're a year into their career, maybe a couple years. Um, I mean, sometimes they're like, man, I'm, I didn't get the job that I wanted my first, you know, job straight out of college. Should I go back and get my master's? Will that will that help me get the job that I want? How would you answer that? Yeah, well, um, I, again, I, you know, I think it depends on your, your circumstances. You know, we have a couple different profiles of learners that enter our master's program, whether it's online or in our face-to-face, uh, you know, hybrid type of format. Um, there are folks who are in supply chain, love supply chain, want to do more supply chain. That's terrific, right? But they want that end-to-end understanding, or maybe they didn't have the academic background for it. But then we have this whole other profile of learners who are coming out of different functional areas. Heck, we have someone from event planning. We have folks from marketing. You know, we have folks from finance. That's actually a great background, right? Um, folks in information technologies, right, who come, you know, into the program and say, oh, my goodness, you know, so much of what you do in supply chain is, is really about process and understanding processes. And that's important in my line of work in information technologies. Or, you know, I'm an accountant and I'm accounting for what happens in the supply chain. It would be really good right. to know more about supply chain. We even have an attorney uh, in our program who is uh, in the ge- office of the general counsel at a large employer. Uh, happens to be a supply chain firm. And he said, hey, I need to understand this industry that I work in, you know, a little bit better. So some of those folks come at this, you know, from the perspective that they're in a different functional area and they want to pivot into a supply chain career or, you know, because they may work in that in the supply chain industry, they want to learn more about it. Yeah, I mean, we've had, I mean, all kinds of these examples, but the one that uh, I remember is is a lady out of, she was in hospitality, I guess that's what you call it, so work for a hotel. And and she's now at Walmart um, mm-hmm. doing phenomenal after she joined this program. And she didn't have any supply chain experience. Mm-hmm. She wasn't in yeah. that job. She just she did she just decided, hey, that looked really interesting and I want to get into it. Um, and so she went full time and, and it worked out great for her. Um, but you also do, I think there is this growing uh, what we're seeing, a growing demand from like salespeople at a at three PLs or Absolutely. in transportation, yeah. that when they're going to the to the to the firms that they're selling to, uh, they can offer integrated solutions, not just this route, this lane, this load, right? So, right. Um, so they can see that bigger picture. They can talk to their to their to the to the shippers easier. Many of our students <clears throat> work in account management. Think of like a downstream customer facing job. Many of our students work in an account management role uh, in CPG, right? Yeah. Uh, selling into retailers. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. Well, and, and, and they need to understand the, supply chain to do that. Yeah, I was going to say, one of the uh, things you guys mentioned earlier, just that broad knowledge um, um, across um, how supply chain is interconnected. The better that you understand that, the better you will be as an accountant manager, as a salesperson. Um, for your clients, because you'll be able to think upstream, you'll be able to think downstream and understand how everything affects things. And that is so much better than someone who's just an order filler. Um, and and I'm confident, um, you know, th- those people will uh, succeed at a higher level. So it's good. You're um, right. I was, on, I was on doing an interview uh, a couple of weeks ago with a chief supply chain officer 
to your point, and he made a comment that uh, mm-hmm. I think is hilarious. And he said, you know, you got to be more than a box kicker, sticker licker. To work <laughs> this field, you know? I thought that was hilarious. I said, I said, can I use that? He said, you can absolutely use it. <laughs> I concur. I agree with that. It's good. Well, okay. So a few more questions as we, as we close out and we wrap up here. So I know you both do a lot of research at the part of what you do um, in addition to um, just teaching in the classroom. Um, any insight on with everything happening in the world right now, um, or in Ukraine, inflation, gas prices, everything. Any insight on, or you know, thoughts on what's what's going on um, and how it's going to affla- affect the supply chain here uh, in the next, you know, three six months? Yeah, well, I mean, Brian's you know more of a supply chain strategy guy than I am, um, but I'll go first to buy him some time to think. How's that? <laughs> so the real good answer will be coming. But you know, yeah, I mean, if, if we've learned anything right over the last two years or so, it's just how complex. Uh, and interconnected uh, supply chains are, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's been a blessing and a curse, right? It's been a curse because, uh, you know, we've had some performance, you know, problems, right? And and some issues that people have been really concerned about. But it's been a blessing because it's brought great light, you know, to the supply chain and uh, and to the importance of the role of supply chain professionals and supply chain experts, uh, which is great. And that's Another reason why so many folks are coming back, 40% of supply chain professionals are thinking about getting a degree in the next 12 months. And I think that's mm-hmm. a lot of the reason why, because they're looking for supply chain uh, expertise. You know, it, it's been really complex, right? It's not just COVID. It's labor shortages related to COVID, right? Mm-hmm. There have been, you know, um, natural disasters that have, that have taken place, right? There have been canal problems, uh, the, you know, legacy infrastructure and inefficiencies at some of our ports have, have kind of been mm-hmm. highlighted, right? Even though, you know, this has happened in part because demand has skyrocketed in many product categories. So we're actually moving more stuff through the ports, about 25% more stuff than we mm-hmm. have in the past, right? So my, my point is just, it's really highlighted the complexity, you know, and the systems thinking, you know, that is this, to your point, Adrian, right? I mean, it's important that you know what's going on in the U- I mean, the Ukraine, Right? right. And in Russia and with, you know, fuel prices and so forth and and try to understand how how these business decisions that we made are manifested in the supply chain. Right. So when we think about problems like, oh, you know, uh, Amazon warehouses had a, a you know, a, a, a labor shortage and a strike early on in the pandemic. Uh, that's an HR problem. That's a business problem that's manifested in late deliveries in the supply chain. Right. Oh, my gosh. We've got 30% more demand for this product category than we've had in the past. Well, that's a marketing right type of demand right. issue, a yeah. business challenge or, or opportunity that's manifested in the supply chain. So I think that you know what you're seeing is like increased complexity being brought to the forefront and the interconnectedness of, of all these you know uh, functional areas uh, that manifest themselves in the supply chain. Yeah, that's Absolutely. I mean that's perfectly stated. I mean I I. I I looked at data because so I used to love that question. I used to give talks, a lot of them. Uh, my favorite presentations were on trends, future mm-hmm. trends. And I've just learned in all of this, I'm always wrong. So mm-hmm. that's yeah. why I'm like answering that question. But, uh, you know, this point, so we're not having a supply chain crisis, in my opinion. Yeah. It's, it's a crisis of all these other issues that are manifesting themselves, right, mm-hmm. to your point. Uh, policy, you know, so so we could predict. I think it's going to get better in the next year, a lot right. better actually. When you start to piece things together, unless something happens unpredicted, right? But if if things keep going as they are, we should be getting, I think, a big bump. I think I actually do. I, I'm really optimistic, and I'm usually not. Um, mm-hmm. But I, it, what it's done, though, I think for companies is said. We've got to be, we use the word agile and all that kind of stuff, but we've got to be better learners. We've got to be able to understand how, when this unexpected thing happens, our supply chain can respond quickly, but, but, but do so without the trade off of, of increasing costs. There's this, there's this, uh, myth of a paradox that you can't be both efficient and, and responsive to these changes. And the best companies do both. And so that's what you just got to be thinking as a manager is how do we do both? 
Well, and yeah, just to add to that. So like I said, I do a lot of work in healthcare, right? And, you know, right now, you know, all healthcare companies and hospitals are talking about putting pressure upstream on distributors and ultimately manufacturers and group purchasing organizations, you know, is to, you know, employ these draconian methods like, oh, well, we've got to reshore all of our manufacturing. It's got to, masks that are worth a nickel need to be made in the United States. Um, and I shouldn't say worth a nickel, but used to cost a nickel, you know, need to be made in the United States. Oh, well, we've got to keep more stuff around. We need, no, need more buffer inventory, you know. Oh, we need to vertically integrate. There are health systems that are actually investing in manufacturing facilities that are making stuff now. You know, mm-hmm. oh, we need to multi-source, you know. We just can't put all of our eggs in one basket. So, so this is what you're hearing, right? And, mm-hmm. and the problem, Adrian, with these practices is it's natural. These are natural responses that work very well if you're in the midst of a major disruption, like yeah. the pandemic. The yeah. problem is that these practices do not work very well when times are more normal. You know, mm-hmm. these are all the practices mm-hmm. that in the 1980s and into the 1990s led to the field of supply chain management. We would not be talking today. Right. Uh, if we didn't learn that these practices were costly and uh, inflexible, you know, frankly. Um, The whole idea behind supply chain is you create companies, right, that can focus on, you know, core competencies, you know, and become best in class, best in world, and then we link them together through supply chains, right, so that you can focus on what you do best. That's fundamentally, you know, what supply chain is about. So what I would suggest moving forward is that, sure, we're going to have this period where we, we become highly inefficient. You know, and, mm-hmm. and we, we are trading off, uh, frankly, the resilience for inefficiency. But I really believe in the long term, it, and I hate to sound like a professor that doesn't have to own his consequences of his speech, but I really mm-hmm. think it's going to be about innovation. It's going to yeah. be around 3D printing. It's going to be around, you know, uh, sustainable materials that can be reused and recycled. Um, it's going to be around how do we create flexible capacity? So like when Brian says, Wow, there's a major disruption. Wow, we we need to have more stuff. It's not that we have more stuff sitting on the shelf that's been there for seven years, right? It's that we have the flexible capacity to be able to adjust and 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 provide you know that type of uh, material or product or service, whatever it was that's that's needed. The, the, I love the idea that you guys uh, both presented there. That is not necessarily that hey, we need to solve the problems before they happen or predict these wild circumstances because we can't do that, right? And if we do that, then we probably are wasting a lot of time or money as an organization. But how do we focus on being as flexible as possible and being able to respond to drastic circumstances um, as quickly and as flexibly as possible? Like that to me makes a ton of sense. Um, and that almost seems like that's, and that goes back to a people issue as well, right? I have to train my people to be able to respond to a broad set of circumstances and be, you know, expect anything, which if you're in transportation and uh, supply chain, you know, you, you've got to be able to expect uh, everything or it's probably not a place you want to be for very long. (laughs) Great point. Great point. That's good insight. Thank you. Okay. So as we wrap up here, two, two questions for, for each of you, Um, you know, obviously in education um, you guys uh, now, teach on a daily basis, what advice would you give yourself, um, your 20-year-old self, um, if you were looking back uh, to say, hey, uh, 20-year-old David, 20-year-old Brian, um, you know, here's the advice I would give you going forward in your career. Hmm. Good question. My, so my disclaimer here is I've never changed. I'm one of those that, you know, everything I did led me here and I love where I am right now, so I wouldn't yeah, change yeah. anything. But the advice I would give, you know, is uh, yeah, that, boy, I didn't even think about this question. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I think just enjoy it and 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 dive in and and you know, it's a great future. It's a great career. Um, learn how to, you know, learn how to learn quicker and faster. A little bit of what I was saying is is focus on that. Um, one of the lasting kind of skills and and ways of thinking as opposed to trying to learn the latest coded coding method or, or whatever um i don't know that's a bad answer but no, no, no. i think yeah. it's a great answer i, I mean I, I feel the same way you know I, i'm much like brian um that's probably why we're friends and colleagues is that you know <clears throat> um 
I've enjoyed, I enjoyed every day of my career. I mean, I worked for 13 years before I started my PhD and I was never, you know, at a restaurant uh, having a martini on a Sunday night because I hated to go into work on Monday. Yeah. That was not me. I enjoyed every day and I enjoy every day as an academician here too. But if I were to look back and say, David, you know, you're 20 years old. And remember back then, if you looked at my notebook, because we actually used to take notes on paper, if you look at my notebook, there are pictures of bowling balls, like in the margin, right? So if I were to tell that guy drawing bowling balls what to do, I would tell him, hey, man, be engaged. You know, mm-hmm. this is, a, you know, school is is just like any other sport, man. You know, it's people mm-hmm. are not just naturally smart. It's not about this muscle that will drive your career success. It's about this muscle. Well, mm-hmm. and the racing back. <laughs> but anyway, it's it's about your heart, right? And, yeah. and just caring about what you do. And if you can do just a little bit more, you know, to uh, make sure that the quality of your work is top notch and you show people that you care, sky's the limit. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I think both of those are good learning how to learn and um, just uh, really taking seriously what what you have in front of you when it comes to, you know, your academics and education is important. Being a former student athlete my, myself, there were certainly moments where I did not <laughs> take it as seriously as I should have. And I do step back and I'm in, man, you know, um, so few people actually step into that, that, that world of whether it's professional bowling or uh, professional ath- athleticism or whatever that dream thing is for you. Um, you know, um, you're there for a reason. Uh, take it seriously and, and uh, you know, learn how to enjoy it. I think that's the other thing. Um, I was also a track athlete and I always tell people I didn't running for the sake of running. Is not fun? Right. So I didn't, I didn't enjoy running until I became good at it. And once I became good at it, I was like, I actually enjoy this. So that process to get there will help you uh, enjoy academics will help you enjoy your career. Um, once you, once you commit and uh, put your, your heart and soul into it. Um, and then last question, um, you know, you mentioned learning, um, obviously, uh, academics. Are there any books either of you would recommend um, that helped you or shaped your journey at all? So, so I'm gonna, you know, you knew this when you first met us. Um, but I, I'm gonna start with reflecting back on your answer. So, David, just so you know, he said he he said it, whether or not you're a bowler, professional, or an athlete. So, <laughs> <laughs> just, just, Oh, you're getting me in trouble here, man. <laughs> um, <laughs> Throw me so, under the bus. So, I, oh, man. So the, the books that shaped me, uh, I don't know if you ever read The Goal um, uh, by Eli Goldratt. Uh, just a classic. Just really changed the way I thought. The Fifth Discipline by Peter Singe. Um, I actually read that in high school. Uh, okay. it, it, it made, you know, it just really changed my world. About now. Um, uh, I, the, the book that I'm recommending a lot, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say it, but it's it's, it's called Deep Work uh, by mm-hmm. Calvin Fort. Um, it's real popular right now, and it's in, it's not a self help, but it's in that people think of it. Um, I just I just think we've got to we as a, as as in in industry and professionals need to move in that direction, or we're gonna have a lot of problems. So that's the second. So that's the second time that book's come up in two days. Uh, for me. So uh, I was kind of hoping you're going to bring that up because when it came up yesterday, somebody said, Oh, Brian said the same thing. So <laughs> oh, that was great. You know, for me, so it was really back, you know, when I was still in industry and back then it was books like the seven habits by Stephen Covey, you know, it's, I liked Stephen Covey before I had his haircut. Um, <laughs> you know, so no, I, that really made a, a big impression on me because, you know, like, like I said, early in my career, I really didn't get it that, you know, they, how you could be successful. There's a process, you know, that you could follow, which is part of what I would tell the young David, which is just work the plan, man. You just work the plan every day. It's going to work out. You're going to look back and be really pleased with what happened. And then the second book I would say was Good to Great by Jim Collins. Uh, And that, that really turned me on, frankly, to research. Honestly, believe it or not, this is part of my journey in getting a PhD. Because if you read the beginning of that book, Jim talks about how uh, at Stanford, he went, you know, he used like 11 or 17, whatever, different GAs over the course of many years. And they started with a block of 40,000 companies and they tracked their returns over a 20 year period. And they were able to identify 11 that met this criteria. And then they studied those 11. And, and this whole idea of, wow, there's actually some pretty you know, interesting 
you know, robust research that, that underlies the ideas in this book. It's not just some person talking. Right. Really kind of ignited my passion for research. Yeah. yeah. So, so those were two useful books. I like a lot of Malcolm Gladwell stuff too, though. Mm-hmm. Jim Caldwell, I love the Good to Great. There's another one by him called Great by Choice that I read that was also really impactful for me. And, and it went back to some of his data um, and how he communicated those. I thought was um, really good. So, guys, thank you so much for being on. I appreciate it. Love the insight. Love the energy. Um, and, and certainly appreciate um, you and the University of Arkansas, what you're doing. If um, people are interested in connecting with you and then also connecting um, and potentially uh, being a part of uh, the University of Arkansas um, to uh, to get their undergrad or master's, what should they do? Well, we're both available on LinkedIn. We've got, you know, websites, of course, that are easy to find. If you just search a search engine, you know, for Walton Supply Chain Management, um, we're, we're going to come up um, and we're extremely accessible people. I mean, hopefully if you saw anything through this podcast, it's that we're not a bunch of stuffy professors here at the Walton College. You know, we're real people who are approachable and actually like to tell a joke once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. And professional bowlers. Uh, well. <laughs> Retired. <Yeah>. Retired. <laughs> no. I'm not a bowler or an athlete. So. Retired uh, pig farmers also. So we'll right. that up. We'll pick soon. <laughs> That's right. Hey, thank you guys so much for being on. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thank, thank you, Adrian. Thank Thanks, you. Adrian. Take care. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Recruiting Stories podcast. If you haven't yet, subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Check us out on LinkedIn, Adrian Chapman, and Cover 3 Consulting is our company page. Also check out our website, www.cov3consulting.com. Again, thanks for joining us, and we just simply want to remind you that you can change the world by putting people in a position where they can do the most good, and you do that by recruiting. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.